that time leading up to the good was ugly, especially for our Lord and Savior. And tonight, we're going to do things a little bit different, and I'm going to just try to bring that out a little bit more of what Jesus really had to endure, especially that week before He was crucified. And if you saw the Passion of the Christ, that's been more years ago than I care to admit probably, but if you watch that movie, it portrayed it very good of the suffering that Jesus had to endure, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. And so tonight, we're going we're gonna to walk through that a little bit and hopefully bring to our attention what Jesus had to go through so we could have eternity with not only Him, but our Father in Heaven. So let's pray. Father God, we come before You tonight on the day, Lord, that Your Son was crucified. On the day that He took upon Himself the sins of the entire world, even though He was blameless. And Lord, as we worship together tonight, we just pray, Lord, that Your Spirit would be with us and that we indeed can visualize just a little bit of what Your Son did for us. And Lord, never forget that even though it is Friday, Sunday's coming. Amen. Our first reading this evening comes from, and I'm going to say morning sometime here, so just bear with me, but this evening comes from Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 10, the prophecy. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each one has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shears, he was silent, and he did not open up his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong their days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn number 229 at the cross.
premonition from Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here a while while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here, keep watch with me. And going a little further, he fell with his face upon the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't have you kept watch for me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I had planned on getting through the Lord's Prayer t by tonight. And because of the circumstances that happened the last week or so, I didn't get it all done. But in that one verse, you see Jesus saying, Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. And in that prayer he taught us, he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And here Jesus is putting that prayer into action. He's saying, Peter, you've got to stay awake. You've got to be ready. You've got to be praying because the temptation is going to be very great. And we know what Peter did a little later on, don't we? Even though Peter was warned by Jesus that he was going to deny him three times, and even though he animately denied that, we know that he ended up falling into temptation. Verse 42, He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away one more time and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. At this time we will be favored with special music by Lindy and Anna.
some it's just an emblem, a formality. It's a symbol that's been used so frequently. Many blaspheme and despise, though it's ancient it abides. A shrine to death that stands for life to me. There was a cross made for the Son of God at Calvary. Two pieces of rough timber on a hill. Through his hands and through his feet, he took those nails for you and me. It's so dear to us. It stood for suffering, yet it brought us peace. It bridged the gap for men, offered cleansing for our sins. An icon that reminds us that we're free. There was a cross made for the sun. that I should ever let my memory fade, but forever keep the cross in view, for that's where I was saved, where I was saved. There was a cross made for the Son of God at Calvary, to pieces of rough Tangled up here. Thank you, girls. Thank you very much. That's a tough one to follow. <laughs> All right. The preparation from Mark chapter 14, verses 17 through 25. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve, and while they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me one who is eating with me. And they were very saddened, and one by one they began to ask him, Lord, is it I? It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips the bread into the bowl with me. 
The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he were not to have been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them all, and he drank from it, and he said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from this fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Our responsive reading is on page 746 in your hymnals. And it's entitled a Communion Meditation. And Jesus, in that last few words of that last verse, gave reference to the new kingdom. That kingdom that we pray in that Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and how hypocritical maybe that entire um, portion of especially Palm Sunday was. But let's read together responsively communion meditation. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. It is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they were outwardly clean. The pain from... John chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, and then jumping to verse 16 and reading 16, 17, and 18. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged 39 times. 39 times he was flogged with a ball that had spikes in it. And in my commentaries, we read that they quit at 39 because... 40 was have been known to kill a man. So when they, they did it to 40, somebody once died. So they quit at 39 because they were not finished with Jesus. They did not want him to die there. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. And then jumping ahead to verse 16. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him with two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Let's stand and sing hymn number 228, Why Should He Have Loved Me So?
From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At this point, Jesus is all alone, all alone. His disciples have either betrayed him or denied him, or they, they ran and hide or he had, and even his own father had to forsake him. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge, and he filled it with wine vinegar, and he put it on a staff, and he offered it to Jesus to drink. Those words are way, way too calm, all right? This person put that sponge on, on a, a reed pole and he shoved it into Jesus' face. He didn't offer it to him. He shoved it into his face. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. See, they, those people, they had, they had more belief in Elijah, one of the prophets of the Old Testament, than they did of Jesus and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. The purpose from Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence? We are being punished justly for what we are doing. We are getting what we deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. We call this week that we have just been going through and what we will conclude on, on Easter morning, Holy Week. And yet, from the human eye, from the human point of view, there was... There was nothing holy, there was nothing good, there was nothing right about what happened to Jesus. Oh, it started off pretty fine, pretty good actually, pretty festive. There was a parade, and people laid down their palm branches, and, and Jesus rode in on a cold, and, and they yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna. And from the outside, it looked like everything was roses. The people of Israel were going to get exactly what they wanted, who they needed, someone who was going to deliver them from the Roman people, and they would be free once and for all. And I learned this this past week at Washington Reformed, but oftentimes when there had been a battle and the victory had been won, the, the winning king or the winning general, whoever it was, he would ride out in front of the parade full of pomp and circumstance. And people would hail him and shout praise to him. And, and the procession would go for miles and miles. And there'd be many people. There was probably a band of some sort, 
singing praises to the victor. And then at the very end of that parade came the losing general. See, they didn't kill the losing general. They wanted him alive. And they would place him upon a horse of some sort, totally naked. And he would be ridiculed and laughed at and spit upon. And he would have to endure that for that entire parade. And then they'd put him out of his misery. I think that gives a whole new meaning to what we know happened to Jesus when he hung there totally naked. The people were saying, Jesus, you have lost. The victor has finally taken his place, and you as a loser have gotten your just reward. But on Monday, after Palm Sunday, we read that Jesus cleansed the temple. He got rid of all the riffraff and, and the deceit and stealing, and lying that was going on. He also, interestingly enough, released all the sacrificial animals. And when I read that, that kind of reminds me of on, on, on Thanksgiving, you know, our president will pardon a turkey, you know. <laughs> this is kind of what Jesus was doing. He was saying, let the animals go. I'm going to pardon them right now. People didn't realize why he was doing it. They probably were upset, but he did it nonetheless because he knew what was coming. On Tuesday, Jesus went back to that temple. He sat down and he taught and he shared with people who would listen. And although their ears heard the words, it did not make any sense to them. And so Jesus, once again, he had to have been hurt by that. He had to have wondered why, oh why, can't they get it? And on Wednesday, he was betrayed by one of his dearest friends. On Thursday, he gave the Last Supper. And as you know, on Friday, he was crucified. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Jesus had taught this to his disciples, and I'm sure as they were hiding wherever they were at, trying not to be seen, trying to not have anyone draw attention, they had to wonder what sort of kingdom was this after all. They might have even thought that it wasn't a kingdom. That somehow, some way, they had been misinformed, that they had been misguided, that maybe they had misunderstood what Jesus was saying all along. Because this certainly wasn't the king of a kingdom that they expected, or that they needed, or that they wanted. Jesus had been sentenced to death by one of the cruelest ways of dying in that time. The only way that would have been considered more cruel than what Jesus went through is if you would have been hung upside down on a cross and crucified that way. Jesus was made fun of. People spat upon him. They they cursed him. They slapped him. All as he walked down that that path to the cross, where the cross was going to be put. And I have to give thanks to Vernon because at our last prayer group meeting, he shared this with us. And he shared what this means. And I probably will not do it fair justice because he did such a great job. But if you look at the cross, it is not perfect. It has blemishes, it has marks, it has streaks. And that cross that Jesus had to bear, if you can imagine maybe a a 4 by 6 or a 6 by 6, it was full of cracks. It was rough. 
I'm sure as Jesus carried that cross, as it rubbed across his shoulder, it wore it raw. And I'm sure the splinters from that wood dug into his shoulder and into his neck. And Jesus could not stop and try to get them out because there was someone there pushing him, forcing him to keep going further. And that ugly old cross, finally, when he got to the place of Golgotha, they laid it down on the ground and they drove spikes into his hands and into his feet. And then several of the soldiers, probably the strongest ones, had the job of lifting that cross up and putting it down into the hole. Those of us who have farmed, who have put in corner posts, maybe we can get a little idea of what happened. Because as they lifted that cross up to get it high enough to get it over the hump and into that hole, once they got pretty close, they dropped it. Just like that corner post, you know, you kind of push it and you get it in place and it goes thump. That's what happened to the cross. Only Jesus was nailed upon it. Now can you imagine the jar to Jesus' hands and feet at that time? But it wasn't done. It wasn't finished because we read of all the other things that happened to Jesus while he hung there. The physical things. The taunting, the teasing, the casting of lots for his clothes. Sometimes I wonder why, why the disciples didn't stand up and say something or do something. But then I think, if I was in that, that crowd, that mob, and that was going on, and I saw all the people who were against Jesus, and there were just a few of us who were for him, would have I said anything? Would have I tried to stop it? No, I don't think I would have. And so that ugliness of that cross, and there it is standing there, and it gets dark. And the jeering and the cheering go on and on and on. Those minutes that seemed like hours, those hours that must have seemed like days for Jesus. The ugliness of the cross. But if you look closely at this wooden plaque, you see only, not only the cross, but you see all these little pieces of wood. And they have different shapes and, and different lengths. Some of them have a little red spilt on them, maybe representing the blood of Jesus. There's imperfections. If you, if you look closely, they, they don't fit smoothly together. They're rough. But if you notice one other thing, every single piece touches the cross. Every single piece in this plaque touches the cross. I believe that is maybe one of the best representations that we can think about tonight. Because we come tonight and we're all different. We all have issues. We all come as sinners full of imperfection. But there is something that binds us together. Scratch that. There is someone who binds us together to the cross. Because we know that cross in and of itself, it has no value. It's who hung there, who suffered there, and who died there. We have so much to celebrate on a day that there really should be no celebration. There certainly was no celebration for Jesus. We know that God turned his head away. He, he, he couldn't even watch it go on. But Jesus says to his Father, 
not my will, but thine be done. I will, I will do it. I will take this cup. I will do whatever it takes. Because I love those people that you have created so much. And because of that, tonight we can come to God's table and to share together once again that supper that He instituted with His disciples before He was crucified on a cross. We come because we believe what God's Word has showed us and what it has told us and what it has taught us. And so now let's stand and again recite those beliefs that we have by the um, <clears throat> using of the Apostles' Creed. Let's stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I thought it was only fitting that we would use this responsive reading entitled The Lord's Prayer as we come close to concluding our, our study, and we will do that on Sunday. But I believe this is an awesome way to confess to God our faults, our weaknesses. And that is what we are to do before we come to this table, that we are to admit that we are sinners. So if Lee would put up the responsive reading entitled The Lord's Prayer, we will read this responsively. And I don't know if you can make out the difference. Can you see the bold letters compared to the, the finer letters? Okay. If I stop reading, you know you have to start. How's that? All right. I cannot say R. I cannot say Father. I cannot say who art in heaven. I cannot say, Hallowed be thy name. I cannot say, Thy kingdom come. I cannot say, Thy will be done. I cannot say, On earth as it is in heaven. I cannot say, give us this day our daily bread. I cannot say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I cannot say, lead us not into temptation. I cannot say, deliver us from evil. I cannot say, thy kingdom come. I cannot say, thine is the power. I cannot say, thine is the glory. And I cannot say amen. Now 
that's rather convicting, at least to me, because there are so many things that were said in that responsive reading that point all to me. But because Jesus Christ fulfilled every aspect of the law, because he lived a perfectly clean life, he said to his disciples and he said to us those words of the Lord's Prayer, and, and he says, let's pray them together. So let's do that now. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So tonight as we celebrate communion, as we celebrate that supper that Jesus shared with his disciples that night in that upper room. I would like you to come forward, as we have been doing so in the past. If you come up Arnie's side, if you will, and come up. If you'd look at the cross, if you'd like to touch it briefly, you may do that. And then come and take some bread and a cup and return to your seats and we'll share it together. And while we do this, Lee's going to play a song. So, and if anyone can't come up tonight because of physical ailments, um, if you need me to bring it back to you after everyone else has been served, I will do that. So let's come, just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to
Roger, do you need some? It should be noted that while Jesus was doing this, or during this same time, he also took and he washed his disciples' feet. One of the lowest, dirtiest, despised jobs of the Jewish culture. He did it all. So we would not have to do anything. And if you noticed in your program, everything up to communion was entitled the, the, the. No me, no I, no you, no us. The Son of God and Him alone did all of that. And then He shared those elements with His disciples. And as we celebrate, may we remember, come for all things are now ready. Lord, the same night in which He was betrayed, He took bread and He broke it. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten, he took the cup and he poured it out, and he gave it to them. And he said, this is the cup of the covenant of the New Testament, of my blood. This do, as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father God, as you have fed us, for our spiritual well-being once again. As you have invited us to come to this table to share in what we do not deserve. Yet, Lord, because of your Son, Jesus Christ, we can come and we can eat and we can drink of the elements. And we know that because of your Son, it is indeed well with our souls, and we give thanks unto you for whom all things have been done, now and forever. Amen. Our thanksgiving hymn is number 246, There is a Redeemer. Let's stand.
God's benediction. Go now with the assurance that even though it's Friday, Sunday is coming and all God's people said, Amen. Our closing hymn, The Pillar, The Old Rugged Cross.